that are watching from home, we appreciate you looking in. We're on lesson 13, the last in this first series of lessons on Isaiah. And it's a pretty prophetic time about the end of the nation of Judea, really. And so we're going to be examining the invasion of the Assyrians. <clears throat> Before we get started, we're going to open up with prayer. And is there any prayer requests before we get started? We've got people still battling viruses floating around in the air. Talk to Marta. She's still experiencing a lot of pain. Danny, keep him in our prayers. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day that we could gather together and worship you at this hour as we study your word. We pray that we would allow the words from your book of Isaiah to penetrate our hearts and minds, and may we always respect your word and fear your judgment that's coming upon us all, that we might always try to walk in your ways. I ask you to be with those that are sick, that are suffering, that we continue to pray for. Not only we know that you can heal them, and we ask you to be with our nation and the leaders. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, <clears throat> we're in Isaiah chapter 36, and uh, we're going to cover the first few verses there, and then also in Isaiah 37. And we'll go through uh, the introduction first that's in your book. We're still in this day of, uh, we're going to talk about this, we're going to repeat a lot of things that we've seen before as we've studied these lessons. Uh, we're in the reign of Hezekiah. <laughs> and in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 5 through 7, we lift some verses out of there. He being Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings. Now we talked about last week in that chapter uh, where there was a prophecy of a king that would be uh, faithful to God and uh, there's some ideas that it could be Jesus referred to there or it could be Hezekiah because it also talks about his princes there's always two things can be true in the Bible and it seems that this might be a fulfillment of this we're in a, we're in a hundred year time frame we're, we're really stuck in this time frame where Isaiah prophesies about things that will happen a hundred years in, in the future. So we're, this Hezekiah is trusting in the Lord again. Uh, <clears throat> he had departed. He come back. Uh, we're going to look at a period of time where Hezekiah actually was succumbed to a deathly illness and God uh, restores him. So all these things are happening, and we're kind of breezing through them all. The Lord was with him, uh, Kings uh, identifies here, that um, he was with him because Hezekiah came back to God. So God prospered him. And in the following verses in chapter 2, our Kings, second book of Kings, chapter 18, the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria. That's the northern kingdom. And Judea is the southern kingdom. And he put them in Hala and Habar by the river of Gozan and the cities of the Medes, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Kings chronicles these events. So in other words, Israel, and we, there's a long history of them going away from God. So God allows the enemies to take them away. 
they would not adhere to the, Mo the covenant that God made with Moses. Again, this is in your introduction. And in 13, Hezekiah, I mean, uh, Kings 18.13, now the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Cenobar, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judea and took them. And some commentaries say 700. Your book says 700. Some say 701, somewhere around this period of time. When you look into Daniel, though, they've been able to chronicle the event, the time frame there. And Daniel's around 600 to 592 B.C. So it is 100 years later we see that these things do occur historically. The Bible is not always something we can rely on as marking time frames. There are times, though, you can. These are some of the times. Michael is very good about telling us that dates in Genesis is another example. There's other times we're not sure. <clears throat> your commentation, or your, in your commentary, they comment, they, uh, I think Jack Lewis is one of these commentators. They quote, the affair is narrated both in the Bible and Seneca Rib's own records. Seneca Rib tells how Hezekiah was drawn into the intrigue of the Philistine states. <clears throat> the how the Syrians came to Lachish, and that's where our scene is today. How Seneca took 46 of Hezekiah's walled cities and many villages, and he, sh he shut them up like a bird in a cage. So that's sort of some of the commentary. <clears throat> We're going to see this is where one of uh, the king of Assyria sends one of his generals to kind of taunt the Judeans. Everybody with me so far? Okay, again, back in these verses that set us up for this lesson. <clears throat> Hezekiah, king of Judah sent to the king of Assyria to Lashish, saying, I have offended, return from me, that thou hast put me up, I will bear. And the king of Assyria appointed and the king, has, has a, or king Hezekiah 300 talents. This is a story we've covered before, where he actually takes the gold from the doors, Hezekiah does, of the temple, and gives it sort of a payment to this uh, enemy from Assyria to sort of hold him off. And so there, there's some cases where we look at this and we look at maybe Hezekiah's lacking faith in God, he desecrates the temple. So all this is recorded again for us in this scene in your introduction. <clears throat> again, you probably remember we've covered this before. <clears throat> Page 120, your commentary, Sennacherib's command, his army advanced 30 miles from Lachish to Jerusalem. So he continues to encroach on the walls of the city of Jerusalem, where the Judeans are inside. And if we've said Isaiah before has commented that they didn't seem to care, they continued to celebrate on the rooftop. Okay, we're going to get into our reading now. And uh, we're going to ask Gene, are you feeling like reading today, to pick us up in Isaiah chapter 36. We're going to read just two through six. We're going to skip verse one. Or we'll come back and cover that. So we're going to comment on these verses first. 36 what? Verse 36, two through six. Mm -hmm. Then the king of Assyria sent the Rabbistan with a great army from the Lashes to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood at the adquit from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And Lelkam, the son of Hebcab, who was over the household of Shibnam, the scribe and Jonah, the son of Aspan, and the recorder came out to him. Then Rashkam said to them, Now say to Hezekiah, 
Thus says the great king of Assyria, What confidence is that in which you trust? I say you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which it, if a man leans, it will go into his hands and pierce it. So if Pharaoh, king of Egypt, do all who trust in him. All right, we're going to ask Evelyn now to read. Evelyn, you're okay with reading? Yes. Uh, Isaiah 36, 7 through 9. And if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars has the fire removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How then can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horses? Jean, would you mind reading again? Now we're going to read 14 through 20. We're going to cover all this. Read one. Isaiah 36. Now we're going to read 14 through 20. 14 through 20? Yes, ma'am. Then saith the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver this city, will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus said the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present, and come out to me, and every one of you eat from his own vines, and every one from his own fig tree, and every one of you drink the water of your own sister until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware, lest Hezekiah pursued you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered its land from the hands of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Aphra? Where are the gods of Sephram? Indeed, have they delivered smart from my hands? Whom among all the gods of these lands have delivered their countries from my hands that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hands? All right, thank you. I apologize, it's a lot of reading. Uh, what we're looking at here in Isaiah chapter 36 is our dialogue going back and forth between the representatives of the king of Assyria and the representatives of the king of Messiah, uh, Hezekiah. Notice also again, we talk about this theme, the pride and the arrogance of the Assyrians. This is that rapid captive speaking here. Yes, and he is a general for the king of Assyria. Sort of like a general for the king is this person. We're going to look at him in a minute. But he stands there in this verses 36, 2 through, or chapter 36, 2 through 6. This Rabbi Saka is sent to Lachish, and he's talking to Hezekiah with his great army behind him. Now, he's talking to Hezekiah's representatives. Notice they're up on the upper pool of the highway. They're, they're standing around a water viaduct well, there, we might call it the plumbing going into Jerusalem, which that would be threatening enough. They're, I think they're standing there for a reason. They turn off the water of the city, they're going to be in trouble. But the arrogance of these people threatening the Judeans is something Isaiah continues to com comment on, is that God is the one that put them in charge. But now they're taking the place of God here. <clears throat> and so they say here in verses 37, uh, 7 through 9, they say, who do you trust in? God? And, and the implication here is, he hasn't done you any good. <clears throat> so they're threatening him. 
and these people, and these captains of the Judean army. <clears throat> and they go on to say about, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He will not be able to deliver you. <clears throat> so there's this dialogue going on, and we're going to dwell into that some more. <clears throat> As the commentary says here in the end, and we're going to look at chapter 37, the Assyrians would sh soon learn who was really in charge and who they should trust in. The Assyrians were trying to get the, Jew the nation of Judea really to trust in their false gods. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of documentation, both historically and Bible that matches up. And this is some of the areas that this was going on in, these pictures that we'll look at today. Uh, the king of Assyria makes a lot of reliefs that we've looked at. We've looked at some of these before when we were studying kings. Uh, but Isaiah is going to document, like a historian, the things that are about to happen. And although it's given by the inspiration of God and it was directed by God for holy men to write, these prophecies, this commentation says, accomplishes what really happens. Senechabar and his army is going to invade Judah. Invade Judah. And they're going to besiege it. They're convinced they're going to do that. But we're going to see a miraculous defeat by God. There's, if you listen to God in the Bible, we're going to see where an angel defeats them. There's other historical evidence that there was wolves or uh, beetles and things that ate their swords and all kind of crazy things happen, so... So we're looking into the first section now, the coming of Seneca Rib and his army. We're going to dive into this a little deeper. Now the first verse we skipped over really sets this whole thing up. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King of Hezekiah that Seneca Rib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judea and took them. This is Isaiah talking. <clears throat> One of these commentators says the Assyrian army struck the coast of Sidon from the point it worked its way southward, devouring opponent after opponent, until finally the Egyptian army finally made a stand about 20 miles west of Jerusalem at the edge of the hill. I remember last time, last week we looked at this, that Isaiah criticized the Judeans and King Hezekiah and his uh, people for going to Egypt for help instead of relying on God. So this is one of the prophecies that are fulfilled as the Egyptians now take a fall. This is what we talked about last week, if you remember. It seems like a month ago. But uh, we had this criticism in chapter 20 where they were depending on Egypt to help them out again instead of being faithful to God. <clears throat> so King Hezekiah, or the king of Assyria, sent Rabakath, I can't say his name, and his great army, from Lakesh to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they stood by the aqueduct of the upper pool on the highway to the Fuller's Field. And Akala, Akalim, the son of Akala, who stood over the household of the scribe. In other words, these Judean representatives come out to hear this general from Assyria. Again, this is the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, so they can determine this is around 700, 701 B.C. And this is the time where Hezekiah was returning back to being faithful to God. 
we just looked at that from Second Kings perspective and Second Chronicles also records the same thing. <clears throat> Another commentator says the history at best is not dull. It recites statistics, dates, and the accounts that in, in exchanges. So in other words, there's a lot of information here, especially describing the arrogance of the Assyrian army. And then the clutch of despair of the Israelites here being the Judeans specifically are recognizing that they are maybe indeed in trouble. We're still in the first section, the uh, Syrian army comes down uh, from the north. And we looked at this in the past lessons where they conquered Syria and Israel. This is Assyrians, different from Assyria. And Isaiah prophesied about this in, in chapter 8 and other passages. The Assyrian army comes up against the fortified cities of Judea and took them. And Isaiah prophesies this in chapter 7. Remember we talked about this too. If you look in the chapters, I believe it's like 12 to uh, 25 or something in there, there's a whole range of nations that come up and then are defeated. And Isaiah prophesies about these little wars that come along and these countries are defeated. So they, they see these things happening as they look back into Isaiah's prophecies. And we skipped over that in Isaiah because it's just one nation after another uh, that rises up and falls down. But Judea still stands until now. So the king of Assyria sends Rabbacus with a great army from Lachesh to King Hazet, Hezekiah in Jerusalem. And this is in Isaiah chapter 36, which we were just reading. The conquering army has moved down now, and all that remains left is Jerusalem. I don't know covering this again, but we're trying to stay within the story as we look at some background. So these are desperate times for King Hezekiah. And who is Rabbashef, which I wish I could say his name, as Gene asked, says actually it's a title, not a name. Describes a field commander, I call him a general of the Assyrian army, who was a representative to the Assyrian king. So when you read that word, Rabbashef, it's really a title, like lieutenant general, lieutenant colonel, not really his name, but he is the representative. Or he might be even called a chief cupbearer for the king. Some high title officer is addressing uh, and he's probably not addressing King Hezekiah. He's addressing his representatives. We read the scribe was there. <clears throat> also, this mention of Lachish is important historically. Lachish is about 30 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And this is where archaeology confirms these events. They're also chronicled in secular history from the Assyrians' point of view. And they have a different take on things, too. They've discovered a pit where there remains about 1,500 casualties from the Assyrian army. Remember, the Bible says uh, 18,000 were killed. We're going to see that. But you can actually see archaeological evidence of this battle this siege of the Assyrian army on Judea. And we're going to see some pictures of that. Yes? Okay, that didn't pay any attention to this rabbi second guess that they went to King Hezekiah and 
their clothes were all torn. And so he tore his clothes and put on the sackcloth. This is mentioned other times in the Bible. What's the significance of that? Michael, what's the significance of that? Tearing your clothes and throwing ashes on top of your head. Is there an outward expression of mourning or deep grief? Or... It was also seen as a sign of repentance in other places. Right. I can't think of anything we do that would be similar to that. But it's mentioned other times in the Bible, yeah. too. We see, a, we see that Hezekiah prays to God for deliverance. He went to the house of the Lord after this happened. God's going to hear his prayer. But it's a sign of, uh, uh, you know, Paul actually talks about doing just the opposite, and so does Jesus, that we're not to display our outer appearance in, in times of uh, prayer and humility. I think the reason Jesus they were doing was teaching for, against it was they were doing it for show. They right. wanted people to right. praise them. Right. I don't think in this case that Hezekiah was looking for public recognition from what he was doing. Right. And the time where we see it in the Bible mentioned where they were tearing at their clothes, and it probably wasn't that they were ripping them to shreds, they were ripping at the fasteners probably more accurate of their clothes. And this sackcloth would be a, we might call it like a burlap sack. You know, it was something that was uncomfortable for them to wear. And we even see uh, as far back as Job, who would have been, yeah. you know, shortly after the flood, he is putting on a sackcloth and pouring ashes on his head as a sign of mourning and distress for what God has allowed Satan to bring on him. So it was, was you know, as far back as the flood, shortly after the flood, that we see this, I don't know if tradition is the right, this practice, I guess. And it's not just a Jewish practice, you know, because when uh, Jonah, that's who I'm looking for, <laughs> was sent to the city of Nineveh, the no. entire city puts on sackcloth and sits in the ashes and asks for God to forgive the city of Nineveh, which we know they do in the story of Jonah. Right. I think that the king making these displays, the people would have followed him too. I think that this, uh, just my opinion, it might be a reflection that the people followed suit. And so there might have been like a national day of mourning, repentance, Recognizing their arrogance of their, their own their own selves, the Assyrians don't recognize this. Though uh, I think there's a point of difference here. So we see on this map where the Assyrians are marching in to these cities, and they're at Lachish, and then you can see how they <clears throat> are having these battles here, and then as they're moving on into Jerusalem, where we're at today in this scene. <clears throat> Again, this is one of these stories that's documented almost verbatim. It's recorded in Kings and Chronicles, and the Assyrians also record these events, although the Assyrians don't record it the same way. Again, they're at this aqueduct, this upper pool, uh, and they seem to be in complete command of the situation. The Assyrians do. Again, I think it's significant that they're by this water. Uh, you turn off your water, you got problems pretty quick. If you run out of hot water, you get, you got problems pretty quick. I think you've all been there. It's not pleasant. But it can be life-threatening in this situation where they're in a walled city, and the first thing you do is cut off the water supply. There's a lot of significance and metaphor there too, isn't there? Who promises, who promises us running waters, eternal waters of life? 
held things off but then another king comes along and not so good and even Hezekiah as you look into his history in Chronicles and Kings he there was times where he was not faithful but they we do see this repentance we see this thing where God keeps hoping that we'll turn around and here this uh, again, this to remind us that last week we were looking in the foolishness of trusting Egypt. And, and the story there again is that we often reach out and put our faith in things we can see and touch instead of the invisible God that we're supposed to rely on. <clears throat> As Michael's talking about, Hezekiah was working on reforming the people. To some measure, it seems the country was reformed at the time of this invasion. Parts of their kingdom is being laid waste. There's still a remnant that holds on, though. We looked at that last week, and we'll look at that again today. <clears throat> so there's some restoration going on. God visits, visits them in time of judgment. <clears throat> Uh, as Michael was talking about, Hezekiah is not only a pious king, but he's prudent in both his administration at home and his treaties abroad. But he tries to appease the king. He's trying to get back into God's good graces. <clears throat> he's doing everything he can now to save his country. Where in the past, some of these kings didn't seem to care. And the people didn't seem to care. Yet the, the army's still coming. Like Michael said, sometimes even as hard as we try, bad things are going to happen. <clears throat> as uh, we looked at in Isaiah 36.1, this is the 14th year of the rain. This is where I'm talking about is looking back into this. There was a deadly illness where Hezekiah's life was going to terminate and he was given an extra 15 years by God. And this scholar Archer talks about this problem about there's a little bit of conflict in this 14th year is what they're talking about in here. But I just wanted to bring out the point to remind you, if you look into the Bible, we're not going to cover it here. Hezekiah was treated with a deadly illness and he prayed for God to help him there. And it almost is a metaphor for what's happening to the children of Judea, children of Israel. <clears throat> uh, this is where I was talking about Assyria actually records these events too. This country, this, these inscriptions, and we'll look into some of these at the end actually describe in their own vernacular this account of this evasion, although they have a little bit different uh, ending. There was a loss of 185 of their soldiers. There's a, there's a grave where they can come up with 18,000 of them. 
it seems that the Syrians might have inflated some of their numbers. But they're in this area now. This, this war does happen. And this is where they came from. And this is where they move into. Uh, oops. Now, all these cities, Babylon, all these cities are mentioned in Isaiah. They come and go. And uh, <clears throat> the Judeans happen to hang on for a while. Standing in Fuller's Field, this aqueduct. Uh, they're standing there in this great army. It says, uh, in, uh, ironically, Rabbi Kesheth is standing in the very spot. This is in your commentary. My E got moved there. The very spot where Isaiah had told Heza not to fear the kings of Syria and Israel. And as Michael said, Hezekiah hears this and rents his clothes and covers himself with sackcloth. So when this whole exchange is happening, he tears his clothes and goes into some sort of uh, remorse, we might say. In Isaiah chapter 37, we're moving on now, God's instrument. The Assyrians destroyed, God's glorified. So what we see here is King Hezekiah does seek the Lord. Uh, The Lord does destroy this army. As Hezekiah reacts to these words that were spoken at Fuller's Field at the aqueduct. By thy servants hast thou reproached the Lord and hast said, By the multitude of my chariots am I come up to the height of the mountains. So we're at in Isaiah 37, 24 through 36. I will cut down the tall cedars, choice fir trees. I will enter the height of the border in the forest of Carmel. I've digged and drunk the water with the sole of the feet. I've dried up all the rivers, besieged the places. Hast thou not heard long ago that I've done it? And of ancient of times, I have formed it, and I've brought it to pass. This is Isaiah speaking for God. Therefore, the inhabitants were small power. They were dismayed, confounded. They were as the grass of the field as the green herb or the grass in the housetops, the corn blasted before it had grown up. But now I abode. And thy going out and thy coming in, thy rage against me, because thy rage against me and thy torment is come upon mine ears. Therefore I put the hook in the nose and my bridle in the lips, and I will turn thee back from the way thou camest. Okay, and this is God addressing the Assyrian army. The hook in the nose would be a reference how they would lead a strong animal around, a beast, like an ox. So God's replying here. <clears throat> he calls them the virgin daughter of Zion. They were despised, they were laughed at. The idea here is that the Assyrians came to ravish the daughter of Zion, as God would look at it, the city of Jerusalem, and God would not allow it. The question might be why Jerusalem is represented as a young girl rebuffing the contempt of the the unwelcome advances of a churl. That's commentator Grogel. By the multitude of my chariots, I have come up to the height of the mountains. Here the Lord describes the great pride the Assyrians had in their conquests, but they forgot that the Lord really placed them in charge and would take them away. And that's a theme we see in in Isaiah. That Isaiah reminds the Judeans, because the enemies would never read this, that God has put these people in charge, and he will destroy them. 
the military machine of the Assyrians that was poised to lay siege to Jerusalem, but God would not allow it. The king of the city of Assyria would not come into the city because it was God defending it, not the Egyptians. Isaiah says, representing God. Remember, we said in the beginning, Isaiah's talking for God. God's allowing Isaiah to be a scribe. For my own sake, God will defend his own glory. And often we unnecessarily think, the commentator says here, that we must defend the glory of God. But God is more able to defend his own glory. Why does God defend the city? For my servant David's sake, he says. King David died almost 300 years before this, but remember God made a promise in 2 Samuel 7, 10 through 17, and he does not come back on his promises. So it wasn't because... King Hezekiah totally in his prayers, although that might have helped. God was also defending a promise that ultimately he would have to allow the Judeans to be taught a lesson except for a remnant. Isaiah 37, 33 through 34. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city nor shoot an arrow there nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way it came, the same it shall return. Thou shalt not come into the city, saith the Lord. And again, I read another commentator where they said, bull weevils and stuff actually ate these arrows of the Assyrian army. Things started falling apart on them. That's what I just read there, Isaiah chapter 37, 33 through 34. As we get into the balance of this lesson, the final section in your commentator here, commentation says, a sign and a remnant of Isaiah. Remember remnant, still a small group that remain faithful that God protects. And it says there in Isaiah chapter 37, 30 through 38, that the angel of the Lord went out and destroyed 185,000 against all the odds. That's quite an army, 185,000 troops. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine. This is is really interesting that the Lord angel did that, 185,000. An angel of the Lord. And and again, archaeologically, they can find a grave, not with this many people in it, but at least 15, 18,000 have been able to uncover mass destruction of an army in this area that we're considering today. The prophet Hosea makes some of the same predictions that I will have mercy on the house of Judea and I will save them by his own strength. nor bow, nor sword, nor battle, horsemen will destroy Judea. Hosea 1 through 7, or 1, 7 says, God will not allow that to happen. <clears throat> so this is the end of the king uh, of Assyria. <clears throat> so he departs with his army. And he went away, returned home, just like God said he was going to do. Back to Nevena. Nevena. I can't say it. Came to pass, he was worshiping the house of Nishrod, his God, and his sons. It says, Adramalek and Shezar struck him down with a sword. Historically, his own sons killed him. Sennacherib left full of pride. Even in his retreat, he still felt he won, it says, according to these historians. And it can be seen in a British museum today how he wrote about this great battle that he seemed to think he won. 
not dissimilar to some of the things we see today, we call it propaganda. <clears throat> Isaiah 37, 30, as we're wrapping up, says this will be a sign. <clears throat> it says they, they think some 20 years passed after this battle, and Senegar thought he escaped the judgment of God, but he hadn't. He met a bitter end, as I just described before. It seems that his sons killed him. The Israelites had been forewarned if they remained, un if they were unfaithful, they would be subjected to enemies that God allowed to invade and cause suffering. You can re see that in Deuteronomy, all these warnings. Way before the reign of Hezekiah, Yahweh determined to punish his people. We call it judgment. And he uses foreign powers. This is not, as Gene said before, it's something we see time and time again. He punishes them. They rent their clothes. They put sackcloth on. They reform for a time. <clears throat> so there has to be an end to this. And we see that we have a, con we, a need for a Messiah to come, I think is one of the pictures that's painted here. <clears throat> Hezekiah's petition to save him, Yahweh there. One of the applications we see here is that, as Michael was talking about earlier, this prayer, this earnest prayer for deliverance, God heard him. Even though there's times where we believe we're not worthy for God's presence in our life or his so our supplications to him, he wants to hear. Isaiah receives a revelation from God, Yahweh. <clears throat> and tells the king of God's response. <clears throat> As we talked about earlier, Yahweh promised King David that his royal line would continue. It continues through a remnant. And we're going to look at that again in the second hour as we see these announcements of the birth of Jesus. This continuation is described again. All right, here's some of the pictures as we go through questions on how the Assyrians documented these events. These are in Museums of History in England. First question is, what did Sennacherib do to Judea's fortified cities? Attacked and captured them. Yeah, attacked, captured, he took them. And it says, uh, whoops, to give you the answer. What Assyrian official was sent to Jerusalem to call for Hezekiah's surrender? Yeah, there, his name is Rebeshika, but that's not his name. It's his title. He's a field commander. <clears throat> Again, some of these reliefs that they can find today to document this this battle. Why did the Lord intercede on Jerusalem's behalf? Hezekiah had prayed to him. Hezekiah prayed for him. There's a promise. God promised a remnant. <clears throat> God always provides an escape. What had the Assyrians done to the Holy One of Israel? He also says that they reproached God, they blasphemed. Remember they were standing there saying, who are you trusting? 
he should be trusting the king of Assyria, not this God you have. He should be trusting in our gods. Whose exalted voice are you listening to? They were so full of pride. It seems to imply that they recognize at one time God gave them power, the Assyrians, but they quickly forgot. These wise men of the day, what sign did the Lord give to the people of Judea to indicate that they would be saved? In Isaiah 37, 30, he says, You shall eat this year such as you groweth itself. Remember, the Assyrians were even going to cut off the water supply. Everything's going to go on. Remember, this is still 100 years before they actually are destroyed. How many Assyrians did the angel of the Lord kill? 144 and 5,000. Which I looked up at 185,000. <laughs> I can't count for a score very well. <laughs> 185,000. Yeah, that's what we had. Yeah. Any uh, other comments? I know we went through this pretty quick. A lot of this is a review. We've looked at this in several lessons. Isaiah brings this up again and again. Uh, the application is always rely on God, even when things seem to be hopeless. This brings us to an end of this series of lessons. Uh, Marion, Tommy have talked, and uh, we still believe this is a good uh, study. We're going to look into the New Testament next, starting next week. If you don't have a book, our trusty servant Larry will get you one. And I encourage you to uh, study every day. I appreciate you all be dealing with me for, seems like about a year now, but it's been a couple months. Uh, I've learned so much, as Gene said, too. I appreciate so much your interaction, your engagement, your questions. Gene always has great questions that stump us all. And it means that she's studying. And I appreciate you all. I know a lot of you are watching from home studying, and uh, the Word of God should always fill our life. But I've learned so much from this series. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. So I appreciate you all helping me through it. And with that, we'll have a new teacher. Yes. Okay. Anybody at home needs a workbook, can't come to the building, uh, contact us, and uh, Marion will see that you get one. Thank you very much.